Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when you all were in Fort Dyer, we discussed that your verdict had to be based on the evidence that you saw and that was presented to you in this case. You also heard that the defense did not have to bring a case at all, didn't have to bring any witnesses at all, but they also could if they chose to. You've heard that you can make reasonable in, in, inferences, again, solely based on the evidence, but what you can't do is what you just heard Mr. Harris do. Mr. Harris spent his entire time speculating, making up things that might could have happened, maybe could have happened, based nothing on the 404 exhibits that the state brought you and the 12 exhibits that the defense brought you. Nothing that he said was corroborated by anything. The exhibits or the 32 witnesses that we brought you and the four witnesses that he brought you. Nothing. Nothing at all. Ms. Dykes took the stand, and when you assess witness credibility, the first thing you need to do is see, is their testimony making sense? Is it backed up by anybody else's testimony? And in this case, she swore on direct and swore on cross over and over and over again that she had no romantic or sexual relationship with Charles Beltran. Yet in her phone, that she is on talking to someone when she gets arrested in March of 2021, March 26th, his name is Lover. She chose that name for him. Yet she sat up there and lied to you. No, I, he was just a business investment. If she can't give you the truth about that one thing that everybody knows, Everybody knows that here. She's not going to give you the truth about anything. Anything at all. Let's read this conversation. She reaches out to lover, Charles Beltran, and says, Hey, love, we good. Takes some time before he responds, and so she says, Guess not. She wants to know, has he said anything yet? She knows he's the one that knows what she did to Maricela Botello in that room. He's the one that knows, and she kept him close for months. That was her choice. She is not the victim here. She is not the victim here. Maricela is the victim. We good, guess not. Finally, he responds and says, yeah. You? She says, yep, I'm still hanging on. Attorney is seeing the wife today. He says, okay. She sat up in there and told you she didn't have a choice about Charles Beltran, but yet her next message is, I really wish we were together. It's hard to watch your own back and tells him you can't trust anybody either. He says, I know. Love. And then he does what Chuck does and asks for money. He needs to change vehicles. That Jeep that she said was hers, but that he has and drove to Dallas and to New Orleans before he went to Utah that's in his possession, not hers. He needs a new car. She says, yes, as soon as I see the attorney. I had to pay him up front, big gamble, but there doesn't seem to be any issue as long as she signs off. Use your reasonable inference. That right there is evidence. You can use a reasonable inference as to who she's talking about. She's talking about Nina. Nina's arrested and sitting in jail in Miami while she ran to Orlando. 
said, I called the jail myself. What did they say? They got warrants for capital murder on all three of us. Now, Lisa Dykes has swore to you she didn't know what happened to Maricela Botello or where she was or anything else. Look at that message right there. She said she thought she was out and about uh, on a bender, going to prostitution motels and things like that. Supposedly, they found her. She's talking about Maricela because they found her body just two days before. She knows the gig is up. She knows the gig is up. And she's got to get the heck out of Orlando. She's not worried about Nina. She's worried about getting her money. It says, But the attorney says they're building a case. They don't have evidence. They are guessing. I'm hoping she kept her shit together. She wants you to think that she cares about Nina? That she thinks Nina's on suicide watch and so she's hoping she keeps her shit together in that way? No, she hopes that Nina keeps it together and doesn't talk. That's what the evidence shows. I need to get out of the state real quick. She's not trying to turn herself in. She's trying to run again. Ask Chuck, how much money do you need? How much can you send? I need to make moves. She says, I have no idea how much there is until I get her shit, Nina's shit. She wants you to believe that she didn't, wasn't using Nina for money? She's trying to get her shit. She's not talking about trying to get Nina out of jail. She's not trying to talking about trying to help Nina, about caring about Nina, about being worried about Nina. She's talking about getting her shit so she can get out of this state. I'm trying to go to our fave spot that I wanted to live for a minute. You think you could get to me there? This woman that testified to you that she was so terrified she felt like she didn't have a choice is asking Chuck, asking this man that she's obsessed with if he can get there to her. Or do I need to come get you? Says, I thought she got paid today. I did. This guy was $2,000 to get the money off of Nina. Who's she worried about? She's worried about herself. She's worried about Chuck. She's not worried about Nina. She's worried about getting that money. He just called me. What did he say? Question mark? Mom. She's arrested. The gig is up. Lisa Dyke sat up there and told you that Chuck was just a business investment. She told you that she had lived with family. And Jimmy, her, her brother, said, yeah, I mean, she was there for us. That's what family does. We get each other's back. We do that. She helped me. And everything was going really well in Mesquite with all of them when all of a sudden... Just weeks before, she tells Chelsea and Aaron and Jimmy that they've got to move out. Just weeks before, she met Charles Beltran. She tells Kat De Leon, I can't live the lifestyle I want to live with them here. Not, I want them to spread their wings and fly. Not that I want them to take care of themselves. I can't live the lifestyle I want to live with them here. And what you see is the evolution of Lisa Dykes right there from when prior to when she met Charles Beltran all the way through to the bottom. Full tattoos. New haircut. Platinum hair. Makeup. The last hair appointment she had with Kat, she changes her appearance again, bright pink. She still has the scars from her facelift that Nina paid for. Nose rings. This is the willing evolution of a woman that was obsessed with a young, much younger man 
that was in the rap scene and in the bar scene, and this is what she thought he wanted her to look like. So that's what she did. That's what she did. But let's talk a little bit about the Lisa Dykes or Lisa Beltran that you met here in court. She was quiet. She was soft-spoken. Her attorney even said, pull that microphone up so we can hear you. Had that little country accent. All of those things. This woman has 37 years of experience in the courtroom. She knows the legal system. She's a negotiator. She's strong. She knows what she's doing. She's successful. She's raised these kids on her own. This is not a soft-spoken, weak woman. This is the woman that when she was confronted in Cambodia in a foreign country by four Cambodian officers dressed in SWAT gear and four Cambodian officers dressed in uniform and one FBI agent looked that woman straight in the eye and said, what jurisdiction do you have here? That's the Lisa Dykes that killed Maricela Vitello. Not the one that came here to court today. Because see, she can change who she is for the circumstance. She wants to control the circumstances. When we talk about motive, it's not like she was so jealous of each of these women that he brought home that she wanted to kill them all. It was all about control. She had told Chuck no more. She had told him no more. And yet he continued to not listen to her. And let's talk about the, the time frame that we are um, talking about. We're talking about in October when she had just spent all this money on Chuck for a rap concert on October 3rd. I'm sorry, on October 4th or October 3rd in Arkansas. The van, the spot, the hotel rooms, the booze. She's walking around in the club. She's getting around just fine. She's done that all for him. All for him. And how does he repay her? Does exactly what she told him not to do. This last slide, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Kat De Leon talk about her hair was always platinum. Always platinum, maybe some streaks of blonde, something bright. This is what she chose to do for her appearance when she was in Florida. Make no mistake about it, she is trying to hide. She is trying to change her appearance and she's not trying to be found by the FBI, by the Dallas Police Department, by the Florida Department of uh, Law Enforcement, by anybody. Now, again, Ms. Dykes, this chart shows the nexus between all the witnesses that were called in this case and the, the people talked about in this case and how they were related to each other. Ms. Dykes got the benefit of hearing every single person in here talk. And what did she say? Of course, she starts with Charles Beltran's a liar. We'll get to his testimony in just a minute. But the Charles Beltran's a liar. Her brother's a liar. Her co-worker, Olivia Martinez, is a liar. Kat De Leon, her hairdresser of years, she's a liar. Jamie Scarpa that she's met one time, one time. That woman's a liar. Chuck's girlfriends are all liars. Freddie Chapman, when he says that she's driving, he's a liar. And so is Dax Stevens. The only person you don't see marked with liars is the only person that didn't show up, and that's Kyle Williams and his girlfriend, Valerie Sanders. <coughs> you heard the call about why he didn't show up, because she told him not to. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, Ms. Dykes talked about her medical records yesterday proving what I don't know. She had a hard time with this uh, thigh surgery? Sure. You read through this, what you'll find is that you have a non-compliant patient, a person who wants to be in control, is not listening to the doctors and causing her own problems. But, more specifically, when you look at 
the appointment date on 922 of 2020, that's September 22nd, 2020. It talks about how on that day, she's discussing with the uh, individual that is, is looking at her. Um, the notes indicate that Miss Dykes tells her on that weekend, I have a trip to Los Angeles planned. That weekend is not October 3rd. We're talking about September 22nd, 2020. That weekend is September 26, 2020. She had a trip to Los Angeles planned with Nina that weekend. But what she told you is that, oh, no, 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 we didn't actually plan on going to Arkansas. That was because we had to cancel our trip for October 3rd that we were going to take to Los Angeles because the doctor told me I had to. And you can read through these notes yourself, but that particular appointment, the, the medical professional tells her, look, you don't need to go and this weekend on your trip. And Miss Dykes was assistant that she was going to go. What you're going to find from those medical records as well is that on October 2nd of 2020, not October 3rd of 2020, as uh, Ms. Dykes said, but October 2nd, she had a follow-up appointment, and the doctor's notes indicate everything seems fine, and they didn't schedule another follow-up appointment until December. If she was in that kind of pain, as she had described to you all, don't you think they would be seeing her on a regular basis? At that point, everything was starting to come back together. Everything is starting to be fine. So much so that she can go to Arkansas, drive four hours in a car, walk around a club and party with a bunch of young, younger men at a rap concert, at a rap show. In October of 2020, Lisa wants you to think that all of these are coincidences. That she renewed her lease, which shows that she intended to be there for a full year, although she testified that, hey, we're, we were already planning on going to Florida. Her lease documents show otherwise. She's planning on being in Texas for a while. that on October 5th, she calls in for an unknown reason. That's the day that Maricela is supposed to return. That's the day that she goes missing, and she calls into work, unexplained. Her call records show her down in Wilmer. Coincidence that the very next day, her wife, Nina, is desperately searching passport offices. How to get a passport passed. How to change your name on a passport fast. The very next day. Lisa's hair and her last appointment goes pink. And there's continued passport Google searches. The very first news article that comes out about Maricela is a WFFA news article on October 11th. Nina urgently wants to sell her Pennsylvania home the very next day calls Jamie Scarpa and says, I need to list it today. Not in a week, not let's sit down and talk about it today. That's just a coincidence. Lisa gets a phone call from the FBI. She tells all her coworkers, oh, it's fraud, it's fraud. It, it wasn't a real person. But tells that FBI agent that she could see on the ring camera was legit. And tells him, you know, I, I haven't seen him in some time. I don't know where he is. I don't know his number. I don't know how to get a hold of him. The very first time she's contacted by law enforcement, she lies. And then the very next day, she quits. Unexplained. Just out of the blue, according to her coworker. Is that just a coincidence, too? These are all just in October. <clears throat> 
October 31st, that first search warrant uh, in the Kensington house looked like they had moved quickly. It was abandoned, property left there. But the blood had been cleaned up. That blood had been cleaned up for sure. And that's her house. Make no mistake about it, she knows what goes on in her house. She's in control of what goes on in her house. When we're discussing the phone records that put her in Wilmer, this shows earlier that day that they are all in the same area at that Kensington home. And if you'll recall, Mark Sedgwick talking about the time, the, the green arc, that timing advanced record, that is a different record that you get from Maricela's phone because it's a different provider, and that's almost real time. And you see right there in the middle, she's at that house. That yellow square indicates the Kensington, 3113 Kensington house. She's there. She's there with Chuck. Then you see the next day, you heard Chuck's testimony. He left out of there, and he didn't go back that day. And his phone records support that. He tells you he went to get an oil change, that he hung out at Carmen's apartment in the parking lot, that he never saw her. Then he went down and got an oil change. And then he goes on and hangs out in the Deep Ellum area later that night. And you heard corroborating testimony about all of that. But here's the interesting slide. That red square right there, that is the location where Maricela Vitello's remains were found. And if you recall Mark Sedwick's testimony that the azimuth is kind of the direct line where you see that V, the azimuth is that kind of direct line, and that indicates the direction in which those uh, cell phones are pinging from. So they're within that, that little uh, angle right there. And these are all the pings of Lisa's phone during that time period. They start at 636, then you have one at 643, 650 for Nita's phone, 702, 707. 716, 722, 738. And each and every one of those, that asthmus is pointing towards the location where Maricela Vitello's body was found. She wants you to think she was at a FedEx place in Hutchins. There's Hutchins right there. That's Hutchins. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten other towers. But if they were really in Hutchins, at that FedEx distribution location, those cell phones would have been pinging off of there. But no, they are within that area of where Melaricello Vitello's body was found. Two turns, two miles from where she used to live. A left on Beltline, a left on Posto. Just off the road where you can park and pull a body just a short distance off the road behind brush. She didn't think anybody was going to find her before the animals had gotten to her before her body decomposed completely. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, what I'm going to ask you to do with that is don't give her the benefit of her tampering with the corpse because she chose to dump that body out there where she knew nobody was going to look and it was decomposed so they couldn't do a full autopsy on her. Don't give her that benefit and speculate that just because of that, there's no way to tell from the autopsy exactly how she died. 
you know how she died because Chuck told you how she died. And his story makes sense. <coughs> when it comes to Charles Beltran, we brought you his testimony, but we didn't bring you his testimony uncorroborated. We didn't just throw him up there and say, tell your story and just leave it at that. There are 404 pieces of evidence that back up his story. Not only that, you have 32 witnesses that the state calls to corroborate bits and pieces of his story. There's not one person that can corroborate everything, but each person can corroborate something. And so let's start with that. Let's start with Raul Ortiz said that she left there and left his place at uh, approximately 1 a.m. or so, 12.30, 1 a.m. because he got sick and she got, took a lift down to Deep Bella. That's corroborated by the fact that the, the surveillance video shows her walking around by herself. And then she meets Chuck. And you see that surveillance video of her and Chuck meeting. And you can tell she wants to go with him. Was it a smart choice? Of course not. Was it a choice that a young 23-year-old that is trusting of human nature and trusting of people would make in that scenario? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a tragedy that she didn't know who she was going to be having to deal with later. Chuck did what he always did. He heard from Dax, he heard from Freddie, and they're like, man, this guy... Five minutes, and he is talking to a woman, and he's taking her home. And he doesn't have to force himself on anyone. He doesn't. And guess what? If she didn't want to have sex with him, it's fine. He's got plenty of other women that do. But this girl was cool, and they were hanging out, and they were having a good time, just like he always does, just like normal. You heard from... Cat De Leon about Chuck and Lisa's relationship, and also you heard that Lisa was livid, livid when she learned that Nina had slept with Chuck without her. Make no mistake about it, Lisa wants to control this relationship between her and Chuck. That is her prize, that is her possession, that is her boy toy. She's the one that pays for everything. She's the one that in, invests in his rap career. She's the one that brought this man in, and she wants to have control over that. Yes, the three of them were together. Yes, the three of them had sexual relationships together. Yes, she and Chuck had se sexual relationships together. But when Nina did it with him, that was not okay. She was livid. And you know that to be true because... Two people that have never met, that didn't know each other, said that Lisa said the same thing. <clears throat> Olivia Martinez said that when she found out about Chuck and Lisa, she was livid. She said, quotation marks, I'm going to make Nina my bitch. I'm going to make her do anything I say. I take a body. Wilmer, after you kill an innocent girl because you want to control the situation? Lisa is the one that got Nina involved in this. As far as what we talked about, what the defense talked about, um, Chuck's fear is real. He's a young black man covered in tattoos. That's his choice. Two-time felon, that's his choice. He pled guilty to those offenses. He served his time and he was out. But when he looked at it, when he ran from that situation, as his girlfriend Jasmine said, he always would as he always did, which is in his nature, which Dax Stevens says, that's how Chuck deals with conflict. He didn't fight, he runs. And Freddie said, that's how Chuck is. He doesn't fight, 
He's a lover. He's a player, but he's not a fighter. He runs. He ran from that situation, and the further that he ran from it, the bigger it got. He told you, he testified on that witness stand, look, I look like the bad guy. I look like who they would be looking for. But I'm not him. I didn't murder this girl. And he had no reason, no motive whatsoever to do anything to Maricela Vitello. Defense makes a, a pretty big issue about the fact that that her four front teeth were missing. And you heard Dr. Casper talk about that the way that those teeth were missing, that they were fully out. They were completely gone, as if they were extracted from her mouth. Not a punch in the mouth with broken teeth. Those are inconsistent. When you get punched in the mouth, your teeth break and you bleed. They don't just fall out of your head. Did you want to check this in the statement of the evidence in this case? It's overruled. The jury will recall the testimony as they heard. They don't just fall out of your head. You are allowed to use your common sense. You don't have to check that in when you are looking at the evidence and listening to the arguments and weighing things against each other. If anything like that happened to Maricela, her teeth would be broken, not completely missing. You understand that there was a lot of animal activity out there. There's a lot of reasons why those teeth might be missing. Her skull might not have been right where it was laying, where it sat when they found it, but it was definitely in that vicinity. Unfortunately, because it was March when they found her body, they couldn't find everything to give you a full picture. Chuck's story makes sense because the DNA evidence corroborates that. This is Chuck's room. You see the two windows right there? You see the blue purplish spot right there where the carpet is. That is where he testified that after Lisa stabbed Maricela, he woke up in his deep sleep. Uh, he'd been drinking. He'd been smoking a little bit of weed. He wasn't sure it was real at first. You and minutes, Thank you. And his reaction was to shove her off the bed and Maricela came tumbling down onto the floor with Lisa, and then he jumped over and he pushed them apart. That stain from the carpet pad piece is exactly where Maricela's blood was found, her DNA was found. So the physical evidence corroborates what he says, the phone evidence corroborates what he says happened after that, the records of Pennsylvania, Mexico, Miami, all of those things corroborate Chuck Beltran's testimony and not one thing of any of this here in any of those witnesses back her up. And she won't even know that she has a relationship. Mr. Brown said that Maricela deserved better than that. Of course she did. She's beautiful. She's full of life. She has dreams. She has hope. She has aspirations. She has to go to work on October 6th. And they want to speculate that she suddenly, within 24 hours of meeting Charles Beltran, became a tweaker, a prostitute, and a drug addict, and was wandering around in Dallas, a place that she doesn't even know. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just not reasonable. Not reasonable at all. You know that she was killed on October 5th, 2020, because that's the only reasonable conclusion that the evidence supports. Maricela Botello deserves the 12 of you, the two alternates, to weigh the facts and the evidence in this case and to come to the verdict of guilty. But you know who deserves that more? 
Lisa Dykes. Lisa Dykes is guilty of murder and guilty of tampering with a corpse. And when your verdict of guilty is read out loud in the courtroom, you're not telling her anything that she doesn't already know. We're asking for a, a guilty verdict on both charges in this case on behalf of the Dallas County community, the family of Maricela Botello, and our victim, Maricela Botello Valdez. Thank you.